Recently, I set off on a goal to tour each major planet and moon location in Star Citizen's current universe, and I honestly can't believe how insanely huge this game is. It might even be one of the largest games ever made, depending on how you choose to calculate that metric. Not to mention, it's scheduled to double in size when the next star system is added, hopefully by the end of this year. Now, initially when I conceived of this mission to visit every planet and moon, I thought it might be a day's worth of flying around and capturing some cool clips. But once I embarked on the adventure, the scale became apparent and the gravity of the task revealed itself as way more than a mere day's quest. Plus, I wouldn't say I've fully developed my space legs yet and thus created a few, uh, shall we say, slowdowns along the way. Like when I accidentally triggered the self-destruct sequence on my ship and forgot what button deactivated it, or when I left my ship without a helmet on before checking to see if there was a breathable atmosphere. Then of course there was the time I realized I wasn't quite the badass pilot that I thought I was, the time that the ARC Corp autopilot decided to fly me into a building, misjudging a crater jump on my hover bike, and then of course falling off of Orison into a gas giant because... Well, I was curious. So, where do we start on this massive adventure? Well, when you first begin Star Citizen, you have to choose a home in the Stanton system. Stanton is currently the only star system in this game, but hopefully we'll be seeing Pyro, the second system, soon. And after that, there's something like 91 systems planned for this game, which is totally insane, especially after you see how much stuff is just in the Stanton system alone. Anyway, for my home, I chose the city of New Babbage on the planet Microtech, which is one of my favorite places in Stanton. Microtech is one of four planets in the system. It has three moons. It's actually the furthest from the star that it orbits. And if you're thinking Microtech is kind of a weird name for a planet, well, that's because this system is owned by mega corporations and they bought all the planets in the system and named them after their corporations. And interestingly, these are actually the only privately owned worlds in the entire United Earth Empire, and they're also self-policing, making them fairly unique when compared to other systems. Or at least Stanton will be unique once there's other systems. Now, Microtech is the most Earth-like planet in the system. It's got trees, oceans, deserts, giant mountains, and a breathable atmosphere, though you probably don't want to take your helmet off in most areas on the account of the negative 100 degree temperature. Due to a terraforming error that led to unusually dense cloud formations, the planet is extremely cold, leaving most of the surface covered in snow. That said, there are non-frozen areas of the planet, and I believe the end goal of the game is to have seasons as well, so who knows how that might affect the overall looks as the seasons change. Now personally, I believe Microtech is one of the most beautiful planets in the system, even though it looks so much like, well, Earth. It's just fun to explore and sightsee, but without question, one of the most impressive locations here is New Babbage, the planet's main trade hub and home of many tech companies. With the temperatures being so cold outside, most of the city is located entirely indoors, but even so, the architects built in some impressive viewing areas. Now, this city on its own is easily big enough to warrant a dedicated video and then some, so I'll keep it topical for the time being, just so we can actually cover the other locations. When leaving New Babbage and flying up to space, you'll likely run into Port Tressler that orbits above the city. This spaceport functions as a good intermediary point for trading, especially for ships that need to do business with Microtech but don't want to fly all the way down to the surface. In fact, all the major planet-side cities in Stanton have similar ports located above them in orbit. Now, Microtech has three moons, Calliope, Cleo, and Euterpe. And like pretty much all the other moons in the Stanton system, there's no major city locations on them, but there are often interesting points like mining outposts, farms, aid stations, and just generally interesting and beautiful scenery. Now, the first Microtech moon, Calliope, probably won't be your first choice when picking honeymoon locations. Intense winds, freezing temperatures, and low visibility make this moon treacherous to navigate. It does have its own style of beauty with frozen mountain ranges and black earth ravines, but unless you have a mission or mining adventure to go on, you're probably not going to be heading over here for sightseeing. 
Microtech's second moon, Cleo, is a bit more inviting. I really liked Cleo because its atmospheric makeup turns the sky green and pink, making it feel truly alien with green oceans and orange coastlines. The mountains are beautiful and there's even vast stretches of desert. Skimming along the coastline is definitely a highlight for me and I plan to go back to explore a little bit more of the biome diversity and see how the sun looks at different times of day. Euterpe, the third moon, well, kind of feels like Calliope in many ways. Depending on the weather, you may be met with harsh visibility, jagged mountain ranges, and black deserts. One thing that does set this moon apart, though, is its vast frozen black oceans. They're kind of cool, and I don't know, maybe it could be used for something. Drift racing, perhaps? All right, let's change the scenery a bit. Okay, let's change the scenery completely. Coruscant, I mean Art Corp, the third planet in Stanton, is possibly one of the coolest planets, locations, things that you will find in a video game, period. Personally, I thought the concept for a planet that's completely covered in a city was going to be just too ambitious, too difficult, too performance killing to even be possible. But those crazy bastards at Cloud Imperium did it. And man, did they do it. Art Corp, an entire planet covered in buildings from corporate headquarters to real estate skyscrapers to industrial plants. It's a sight to behold and then to behold again because Honestly, how? Seriously, how did they make this? Well, okay, I kind of know how they developed the procedural tech behind it, as they've made videos showing exactly how they did it, but seriously, it's still just stupidly impressive. And even though I've seen this multiple times and explored it almost three years ago, the wow factor has certainly not died down and probably never will. In universe, Art Corp is the single most industrialized world in human space. And there is in fact no more buildable space on the planet's surface, so new factories are actually built upon existing ones. The latitudes of the planet have a solid ring of fusion drive factories, which are capable of outfitting hundreds of thousands of spacecraft each year. And when it comes to professions, if you spend a lot of your time mining or in industry and trading, chances are your supply lines and trade routes are going to end up at Art Corp sooner or later. Now, if you're going to Art Corp, Area 18 is really where you want to go. It's got an epic spaceport, hover cars, shops, commerce centers, giant holographic women, and endless back alleys to explore and get lost in. The city, or city planet, also completely transforms at night with neon lights and holographic signs. I shudder to think what the power bill looks like on this planet. At a distance, the views here are just jaw-dropping, but up close and in the middle of Area 18, its environmental design and detail will rival any game out there. Again, Art Corp is easily worth a standalone video, which I actually made three years ago, so why don't we just leave it at that. Now above the planet we have Bajani Point, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a space station that serves as an intermediary shipping location. And really one of its best features is just having a nice view of Art Corp from the main lobby area. Not a bad spot to rest and relax before quantum jumping off to your next location which in our case is Art Corp's first moon, Lyria. Lyria is a small frozen moon with a thin atmosphere that lets me get my anvil arrow up to and past a thousand meters per second for doing sweet low level surface flying and then blacking out at 15 G turns cause I'm such a good pilot. There are supposed to be cryo geysers and cryo volcanoes here, but none of them were popping off during my visit. It might only happen during certain times of the day, I'm not quite sure. It's certainly got much better visibility than Microtech's frozen moon, so it's got that going for it and some pretty looking ice formations. Art Corp's second and last moon, Walla, is a fun chunk of rock. And although it supposedly has some type of atmosphere, I sure as heck didn't see it. And what's nice about that is that you can really just enjoy a full sky of stars while rocketing over the dark gray cratered surface. The green outcroppings are actually geode formations, which the moon is covered with. They're certainly pretty, and Walla looks like it could be a fun place to do some mining. Then again, I'm not in the mining profession, so I have no idea what I'm talking about. It's just a cool looking spot. Now, if you're getting tired of all of these solid planets and moons, well, then Stanton's second planet, Crusader, should get you pretty excited. 
and this is entering classic Star Citizen territory, as Crusader and its orbiting station Port Olisar were the first home to many pilots who dared to explore the early stages of Star Citizen's development in the Persistent Universe. But things have come a long way since then, and while Crusader used to be just a cool looking ball of gas that you could see, it's now home to Cloud City, I mean Orison. Orison is a floating city that lives in the upper atmosphere of Crusader, which is actually breathable. Crusader Industries, the mega corporation that owns this planet and city, does its ship manufacturing here, which allegedly lowers production costs as they would otherwise have to be built in space, requiring all kinds of extra zero atmosphere gear and expenses. Beyond manufacturing though, residential and tourism are big parts of Crusader's economy, with many finding Orison to be the most beautiful port in the system. And one day we may even get to see the giant space whales that live in the atmosphere of Crusader called Storm Walls. There may even be some gameplay mechanics in regards to harvesting stuff that grows on the backs of the Storm Walls. These creatures are already heavily built into the lore of the city with the spaceport selling Stormwall plushies and the promenade featuring a Stormwall sculpture. Overall, Orison is very, very beautiful, but it does take a while to get there, having to descend slowly through 70 kilometers worth of atmosphere. It does make the city a little bit less than ideal for trading since it just takes so darn long to get down there. Now, Crusader's moons are actually some of my favorite moon locations in the verse. Granted, its first moon, Selen, is, well, as far as I can tell, THE moon? Okay, it's a bit more hilly than our moon, but it certainly shares the same color palette of gray on gray on gray on gray. The hills are supposed to be volcanoes, most of which are dormant, but according to the description, there should be some active ones still, though I didn't see any on my exploration. The nice thing about Selen is the low gravity and hilly terrain is great for doing some sweet hover bike jumps. Crusader's second moon, Tatooine, I mean Daymar, is also a classic planetoid location. Sure, it's a giant desert moon, but one that's home to caves, secret hideouts, crashed spaceships, and just cool meetup locations. And while Daymar might seem rather lackluster after seeing Art Corp or Microtech, there is something about a desert moon in a sci-fi universe. Stuff happens here, man. We just need some pod racing circuits to bring this place to life. Now, the third and final moon of Crusader is probably one of my favorite moons, Yella, another icy frozen moon. It features beautiful frozen lakes and snow-capped mountain ranges. It's a good place to explore and take in the scenery with Crusader resting on the horizon. But the real hidden gem of Yella is its rings. As far as I know, it's the only moon or planet with rings at the moment, and they look awesome. You can quickly fly out to the rings for mining and exploration, though according to lore these rings have been mined out of their most valuable resources already. In fact, there's still antennas located on some of the larger asteroids that may have been used by the miners when they were active. There was also a mining asteroid base in the rings called Green Imperial Housing Exchange, and you can still travel to it, though it's now known as Grimhex. And to be honest, this is definitely one of the cooler and more dangerous locations in Stanton. After the ring mining dried up, the asteroid base was abandoned and later taken over by outlaws. Anyone can land at Grimhex regardless of your criminal rating, and if you log off in the universe with an active crime stat and you're you're not sleeping in your ship bed, well then when you log back in, you're going to be at Grimhex. The base has a wonderfully haphazard interior with shops for all kinds of wares and even some cool shady quest lines that you can get into. There's even secret entrances to the base if you need to make a sneaky escape without anyone noticing. The proximity of Grimhex makes Crusader and its moons a pretty good hotspot for player-run criminal activities. Now last, but certainly not least, is the planet Hurston and its moons. Hurston is the closest planet to the star and it's owned by Hurston Dynamics, a family-run weapons manufacturer, and they have bled the planet dry, turning most of it into a dystopian nightmare, which is awesome. 
Loreville is the main city, and if you're heading down, make sure to queue up the Blade Runner theme song, or better yet, let the game do it for you, as Star Citizen comes loaded with tons of scores that evoke just the right ambience for what you're seeing. The corporate headquarters building is a bit hard to miss as you make your approach. Its size is so massive that it can easily be seen from orbit. Smog, rust, fire, neon lights, and mega buildings, it's enough to make you want to plant some roots and start hunting replicants who are trying to get off world. The designers certainly didn't hide their inspirations with all of the brutalist architecture, piles of trash, and rundown shops. I like this place a lot, and anyone who's a Blade Runner fan is probably going to feel right at home. Now, of course, Loreville is just a city on this massive planet, and the planet itself actually has some interesting biome diversity once you go exploring. Trash covers a lot of the planet with junk fields, broken down ships, and destroyed components that go for as far as the eye can see in certain areas. Further exploration, however, will also reveal some cool looking savanna areas, strip mine landscapes, wastelands, and other weird little areas. I like it all, and honestly, I could spend hours bombing around Hurston looking for trouble or just admiring the sunset through the polluted atmosphere. Global warming looks fine, what are you guys worried about? Now Hurston also has a total of four different moons. The first moon is Ariel. Probably one of the more colorful planets when seen from orbit, Ariel could easily deceive you into thinking that you're up for a fun romp through a beautiful environment. However, once you touch down, you'll realize the environment alters between rocky waste to swampy waste. The heat and moisture creates a haze around the entire planet, making for a fuzzy lighting sensation. And although it is nice to see some variety, I can't say I wanted to hang out for too long. Aberdeen is the second moon of Hurston, and it's, well, basically hell. Hot, dry, and dead. The burnt, twisted remains of trees indicate that at one point this moon was actually lush and fertile. Rumors are that Aberdeen Hurston, the scientist who the moon was named after, used the moon to test his antimatter weapons. And now nothing lives here. Except, of course, the poor bastards who are stuck in the Klesher Rehabilitation Facility, aka that prison you go to when you do bad stuff and get caught. I can't think of a better moon to put a prison on. You might be better off just staying in your air-conditioned underground facility than trying to escape. Now, a free player can fly to the prison if you don't mind getting shot at. Prison escapes are not taken lightly, so if you're heading over to help a buddy out of a bind, be prepared to take some incoming fire and or die. Now, Magda is the third moon of Hurston, and I gotta say it's a step up from the first two. The orange and blue moon has an atmospheric composition that turns the sky blue and creates a harsh light making the world feel very alien. It's covered with oddly colored mountain ranges, deserts, and a beautiful haze effect that silhouettes the mountain ranges against one another. The fourth and final moon of Hurston is Ida. And although Ida's temperatures aren't quite as extreme when compared to other moons, the weather was sporadically stormy, which really brought down visibility and made navigation very tricky. The terrain is also very unforgiving, with lots of tall rocks, steep hills, and deep craters making ground vehicle maneuvering quite tricky. I personally really like the white-green horizon lines created by the totally unbreathable atmosphere. At times, the moon made me think of that landing sequence from the movie Alien, where you can't see anything and the weather is stormy AF. Ida is certainly not a place for the weak-willed, but as mining gameplay loops are further balanced, it's possible Ida could become a high-risk, high-reward environment for those willing to risk its harsher conditions. Now that's actually all of the planets and moons in the Stanton system as of right now. There's definitely a lot more space stations and other landmarks, or rather space marks, worth exploring beyond the planets, but to be honest, they're far too numerous to go over in this video. Not to mention each planet and moon itself is massive in scale and houses many hidden locations, easter eggs, cool missions, waypoints, caves, shipwrecks, and at some point even fauna will be added to the planets that can sustain it. 
Maybe even one day your profession could be an interstellar game hunter. The depth, detail, and scale of Star Citizen is just relentlessly amazing, and Stanton represents a small chunk of Star Citizen's planned universe. The neighboring star system Pyro will hopefully be added to the game at the end of this year or early next year, and it's bringing another six planets, six moons, some crazy looking massive asteroid clusters, a flare star, and a giant pirate base called Ruin Station. This system is kind of the opposite of Stanton as it's totally lawless and the planets mostly don't support life or livable conditions. This means that piracy and those with a mind for adventure will probably have a lot of fun here. And after Pyro, with any luck, we'll get Nyx, and then Odin will eventually make their way into the Persistent Universe as well. But again, that's probably a ways down the road. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It took a while to make, but it was a lot of fun and really gave me a whole new level of appreciation for just the scope of Star Citizen. I definitely got the Star Citizen bug and I look forward to making more content for you guys. If you're thinking about grabbing the game, be sure to use my referral code to get additional in-game credits. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap signing off.